distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to our AT campus, both here and online. And a warm welcome to the launch event of the AT Enterprises Alliance. My name is Mom Luang Pani Sashimpon, truly honored to be the master of ceremonies today. We have a full day ahead of us, so without further ado, please allow me to welcome AAT Vice President for Knowledge Transfer, Dr. Naveed Anwar, for the welcome remarks. Good morning, uh, honorable chief guest, uh, our keynote speaker, excellencies, and honored guests. Uh, very warm welcome to AIT. Uh, I know that those of you who do not come here regularly, it seems like a very far off place. And sometimes when I invite my friends, please visit me in AIT, I said, AIT is so far in Patum Thani, another province. But somebody like me who communicate, commutes every day, it doesn't seem so far. So uh, thank you so much for taking the long drive here. And I hope that you will enjoy. You know, normally, AIT is about two degrees temperature lower than Bangkok. So I always enjoy the winter when I come to campus. So I hope we have that today as well. So thank you once again for joining us. Uh, let me say something about this event today, uh, because this event has two parts to it, uh, which are very significant. The first one is that this is going to give us an opportunity to look ahead. In the current situation, everybody is talking about COVID and what we are doing. And we are thinking that this is going to pass. And let's look ahead. So that's why the theme of this event is towards 2030. And that's another goal that many organizations are looking, looking forward to. So that's the main focus of today's gathering. And we are very fortunate to have many experts who will be enlightening us on what they think the 2030 might be, or should be, or would be, or could be, all of those things. And uh, we have experts from the government agencies. Uh, we have people from United Nations agencies. We have from the international, uh, multinational corporate. We have local major corporations. And we have startups and other small enterprises. And obviously, not to forget AIT. So we have a very good set of panelists and experts who will be uh, talking about this coming 10 years, what we are going to do. The second important part of this event today is, of course, that we will be also marking the launch of the AIT Enterprise Alliance, which we hope will serve as a platform uh, for enabling and facilitating and expanding the collaboration between academic institutions and the enterprises. When we say enterprises, we are taking more broadly anything that is outside AIT will be categorize an enterprise, whether it is government, uh, you know, international NGOs and all. So we will be uh, reaching out after this event to, 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 uh, to our key partners and uh, forming this alliance and then working out how it can work together towards 2030 and beyond. So we, we as, I, as I mentioned, we have, uh, you know, very fortunate to have many of our current partners uh, who have been working with AIT for a long time in many areas. We are very grateful for them to be here. So this alliance will not only help to expand um, our collaborations with them, but also invite other members into the alliance so that everybody, you know, all of us in a broader, broader um, sort of uh, perspective work together. So with that background, I would like to welcome all of you. And we hope that we have a fruitful day ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. And now I'd like to invite our president, Dr. Eden Woon, to deliver the opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. I welcome all of you here, as our Vice President Knowledge Transfer uh, did, uh, to our uh, beautiful uh, and bucolic uh, AIT uh, campus. But don't let the uh, uh, serenity uh, fool you because we're a very dynamic organization moving forward as you see from the theme of the conference today uh, towards 2030 uh, and I should say that I would like to add the two words and beyond. So we're not only looking forward towards 2030 but beyond. AIT as you know has had a uh, 61 years of history uh, and a legacy of working on capacity building, sustainability, and social impact. So the legacy is based, the history is based on social impact 
But in order to go forward, we must inject innovation into what we do. And thus the motto, social impact with innovation, has been coined for AIT. But in order to be really living up to our motto, social impact with innovation, we need to get there. And so the process of getting there is what we call transforming AIT. In other words, we have had a great history. We're doing very well right now, but we have to continue to do well because this is a very competitive world uh, and we need to keep on moving and, and, and try to live up to our motto of social impact with innovation. Thus, the work we're doing right now at this very minute, uh, ever since actually since I've been in the office for uh, two years and two months now, uh, the work we're doing is transforming AIT. So how do we do that? How do we transform AIT? So this is where, we, in my uh, first uh, speech to the uh, audience in this very hall, uh, I, I came up with the initials I squared, E squared, S squared. So the first I stands for innovation, the second I stands for international, the third, uh, the, fir the E, first E stands for enterprises, the second E stands for entrepreneurship, the first S stands for stakeholders, and the second S stands for support. So we feel that in order to really transform AIT, we must fire in all cylinders and achieve things, achieve goals, achieve tasks that in these six areas. In innovation, in both teaching and uh, research, uh, in international, uh, giving AIT a global footprint, a, uh, a radiated influence uh, within Asia and beyond, and we have to work with private enterprises. We have to work with enterprises more. We have had a great history of working with NGOs, working with governments, and we definitely want to continue that. But we feel, and I feel strongly, that in order for AIT to be relevant going forward, we really must engage with private enterprises more than before. We always have, but we want to redouble our efforts in doing so. And entrepreneurship, I think in this day and age, there is not one single young person who does not dream to be Jack Ma that does not dream to be Bill Gates, and does not dream to be Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg. And so we want to nurture people from this region, Thai students and students from other parts of Asia uh, in entrepreneurship, to give them a taste, give them some sort of uh, training or education or immersion in startups and entrepreneurship. So that's the second E. Third is stakeholders. Our most important stakeholder are our students. And this is why we're working very hard to bring our overseas students back on campus as we speak. We have, uh, thanks to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, and the, His Excellency, the Deputy Permanent Secretary is here. Uh, we thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for facilitating and uh, getting us uh, to be able to be qualified as an organizational quarantine. So we're able to provide a very um, uh, inexpensive uh, quarantine quarters on campus for our students because we believe strongly that our students need to come here to enjoy Thailand, to enjoy AIT, and to have a residential international education. And this is uh, ongoing as we speak. And also the stakeholders, of course, include the alumni. The alumni are a very important group for AIT. There are about 25,000 across uh, over 100 countries. Uh, around the world. And uh, they also, uh, many of them are uh, ent entrepreneurs themselves. Many of them actually uh, own or uh, are high level uh, officials uh, in uh, enterprises themselves. So they definitely are an integral part of this transforming AIT. And finally, support. Uh, support comes in many forms. Uh, sure, people always think of support as uh, donations, but that's just only one aspect. Support means working with AIT on a number of things, whether it be research, whether it be internship, whether it be job employment, uh, whether it be executive education, many, many things that AIT can provide. So coming back to AEA, which is the AIT Enterprises Alliance, 
I think that as the day goes on, you will see that ADEA embodies all six of those letters. It deals with international because we have multinational companies that we work with. It deals with innovation because, especially this afternoon, you will be hearing from some very young companies and, and companies who are aspiring to be, uh, uh, to be the uh, future uh, you know, models uh, of uh, model companies and uh, many ideas of innovation. And then you will, of course, enterprises. That's even in the name of AEA. Uh, entrepreneurship, because many of the companies sitting here and on the panels are startups. Uh, and stakeholders, because all of you I consider stakeholders, because another important stakeholder component uh, are the community. Uh, and uh, whether it be people or companies or other organizations. And finally, support. And we thank you, uh, many of you, for the long time support and the continuing support and the future support that uh, you've been uh, uh, giving. And so AEA, I don't want to talk too much about it because I think we have a, a video, corporate video on it. Uh, but we, have, um, we are hoping to include in the alliance uh, inspiring companies, inspiring companies like B. Grimm. And the uh, founder and the CEO and the chairman is here. Uh, Dr. Link, and uh, we have uh, uh, aspiring companies, and we have companies which are both inspiring and aspiring, uh, and so those companies we hope will work with AIT, work with each other, help each other, and through the alliance that all of us become stronger, and AIT gets the support that uh, we need in order to put us on the road of transforming AIT. So uh, lastly, I thank all of you for coming here, and I thank those of you who are online, who are looking at this and listening to this, and uh, please don't forget the afternoon. We have three concurrent panels of very interesting, very interesting speakers, and uh, I welcome you to AIT. I wish you uh, the best in your business and your uh, organization's mission, uh, and of course, uh, at this uh, year of 2020, I wish you all to stay very, very healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. And as he just mentioned, uh, we would like to now invite all to watch a short clip introducing the AT Enterprises Alliance. The Asian Institute of Technology launches its newest initiative, AIT Enterprises Alliance, AEA, a network of AIT and enterprises to interact and collaborate on business growth with social impact, knowledge exchange, leading edge research based solutions, and human resources development. AIT Enterprises Alliance AEA will serve as the communication and knowledge exchange channel between AIT and enterprises. The AEA network will foster bilateral engagement between AIT and the enterprise and provide opportunities for multilateral collaborations among the network members. The Alliance will facilitate innovation, professional development, and advancement of industry academia collaboration. The benefits for enterprises include working with international experts for validating and developing new ideas, recruiting highly sought after graduates, fostering innovation through AIT's entrepreneurship center and create startups, engaging with international business and management experts, building long-term brand with AIT. Alliance members are given preferential access to AIT's knowledge portal, AIT share e-learning platform, recruit students for internship, dedicated team responding to enterprises queries, special packages when joining various programs at AIT, 
AEA will also facilitate collaboration among Alliance members to work together in mutually beneficial endeavor. AIT Enterprises Alliance Initiative for Industry Academy Collaboration And now for the launch, allow me to invite three guests onto the stage. First of all, AT is truly honored to have with us today as our chief guest, His Excellency Mr. Shutin Thon Kong Sak, Deputy Permanent Secretary for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Thailand. Please welcome His Excellency Deputy Permanent Secretary. Thank you very much. Next, we have Dr. Harold Link, CEO and owner of B. Grimm. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, we have our president, Dr. Eden Wun. Thank you. Now, please join me in the countdown to the launch of the AAT Enterprises Alliance. So, all together now, we'll start at five. So, five, four, three, two, one. Now, with this photo session, we will make this a memorable moment in our AAT milestone. So, a few minutes for the photos as we are creating an even stronger linkage between the academia and the enterprises. So thank you all very much. May I invite all of our guests to kindly take their seat. Thank you. Now that we have witnessed the launch of the AAT Enterprises Alliance, let me share with you how the Alliance website will facilitate interaction between AAT and the enterprises and also help to meet the objectives of the Alliance as we have witnessed in the launch video. The website will provide targeted information about the resources and expertise available in AIT readily accessed by the enterprises. It will facilitate the engagement of interns, providing them with practical experience through industry assignments. The Alliance website will also serve as a pool of various knowledge products generated through AAT's academic research, sponsored and consulting projects, and other publications, as well as its capacity building programs. We will soon share the dedicated links with the participants of this event and information on how to join the Alliance. And now for the chief guest remarks. We are once again extremely honored to have with us Deputy Permanent Secretary, His Excellency, Mr. Xu Tinton Kong Sak. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. I've worked in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for maybe 35 years already, so I shouldn't be nervous about anything, but I'm nervous about coming here today. <laughs> it, that's because there's an aura to the AIT, and, uh, and it's an organization that predates even me, so it was born before me. And uh, coming here again after about 10 years' absence, because I, I was involved before when I was Deputy Director General of the Department of International, International Organizations. I, I can feel a vibrancy you know, in the AIT. I think there's, there's new life and we are on a positive trajectory. And uh, there's, there's hope and, uh, for AIT and for Thailand as well, because you are located in, in our country. Um, a lot of people now talk about 2030. And um, one thing I can offer, you know, my, as my own observation is that I feel that the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, made the debate about development more rounded, you know. Um, in Thai, I would say, glom glom, more balanced, you know, like Thai food. Uh, because before it was about a bigger cake, yeah, but, but now you can see that um, with all the disruptions around the world from the pandemic or, for, or from social disruption, you can see that um, 
you can't advance without leaving vulnerable people behind or you can't uh, have everything that you had hoped for if you know society surrounding you is uh, vulnerable so I, I feel that as for our work in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in pushing forward advancement in the, the global in global scale and for Thailand's own advancement it makes it easier because now we don't have to explain you know why you need uh, quality growth why you need sustainability why the environment is important why human rights why uh, wellness well-being is important so uh, as we look go, move forward to 2030 with the AIT um, that that is how our agenda will be you know it will it'll, it'll, I hope it will be one where the world uh, sees more eye to eye and uh, we're not um, divided into uh, you know capitalism versus uh, you know socialism or, or, or whatever you know and that uh, we can all see that all these issues are important and that people are at the center having come back from India uh, I was ambassador to India until actually until the 1st of October <laughs> uh, which is not a long time ago I, I always uh, took pleasure you know in seeing that we have been issuing what you call certificates of entry you know for students of AIT I look at the profile of uh, who's coming in and, and so on and what kind of ties are living in India because it took the pandemic uh, for me to get a true grip of what, how many Thais are in India? You know, I thought when people used to ask me, I would say 1,200. But we had repatriated 4,000. You know, and and you sh you shouldn't uh, say, you know, he's the ambassador. Why doesn't he know? You know, how many Thais there are? Because wherever you're from, you know, when you go to, I mean, do you go and report to your embassy when you go to a certain country? No. You know, you only go when you're in trouble, right? So anyway, so we, we've had the privilege of helping uh, over 4,000 Thais come back. I, we haven't uh, done as well with the Indians coming to Thailand. Like, um, it's only in the thousands, you know? And uh, if this country is to recover back to before COVID-19, uh, then the movement of people needs to be a lot more. Even though you press on flight radar and you see that there seems to be a lot of movement, you know, in aircraft and so on, it's still a fraction of what it was before. But anyway, uh, I think COVID will be with us for another year. And um, as I'm one of the top five in our organization, we call it the G5, uh, what I find is that we have to look after the the uh, emotional and psychological well-being of our of our people from the Thai perspective you know a lot of our colleagues overseas are now longing to be back in Thailand because uh, fortunately for Thailand we're doing quite well in terms of fighting COVID and um, so th that means the currency of Thailand has gone up um, and hopefully that will rub on to with AIT as well in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I'll be around for a few more years and uh, working with a AIT. I hope that uh, I'll be able to make my contribution to AIT and indirectly, of course, you know, to my, to my country. I have faith in the AIT and uh, I know that it can be, you know, uh, as great as Asia's MIT. Um, I have a prepared speech, but uh, I've, I've gone off script and I don't think I'll go back to it, but in the, in the speech it talks about Thailand's, uh, Thai government's um, support for the AIT, and that will always be there, okay, because I, I've taken a pulse of, my, of things at work, and there's no, you know, uh, there's nothing that will deviate from that, and uh, I will look after this area of work and I will see what I can do to support AIT, you know, if there are any, anything that you feel is uncertain or whatever, come and see us, because I don't see any uncertainty, whether it's the land or whatever, you know, because AIT is a contribution to our country, and uh, we see our country as a part of ASEAN. You know, the way Thailand looks out, it's not 
only from our perspective, it's from what we can do for the sub-region that we are in. You know, yesterday I was talking about Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar. Vietnam has already gone ahead, but Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, and then ASEAN, and then beyond that. One of the reasons they brought me back is to do the BIMSTEC Summit, the Bay of Bengal uh, grouping of South Asian countries and Thailand, Myanmar. Um, in 2022. The other one is the APEC summit in 2022 as well. So those are the big events for Thailand and I will see, you know, and I hope that you will find opportunities, you know, for AIT to get to be involved in that because you are certainly one of the stakeholders in, in Thailand. Uh, I think I wish you all the best, you know, for the AEA. I had asked before, you know, uh, how different it is, you know, from the dual education that the other institutions are doing, and I understand it's, it's broader. And uh, I think that educational institutions and enterprises, it's a positive partnership, you know. There's, there's nothing negative about that, and I, I'm glad that you've started the AEA. I will spread the word. You know, for those that who do not know AIT or AEA yet, I'll tell the Thai, big Thai companies that do come and see us as well, you know, to make a contribution to AEA, AIT in different ways, not, not just the traditional way. Uh, because in that, in that way, they'll be contributing to, to us and to the Asian region as well. So thank you very much. All the best. Uh, I, I feel humbled by the AIT, you know, <laughs> a little bit scared. <laughs> But uh, I think for the first time I've done okay, and I hope that I can contribute uh, at other meetings, you know, in the board and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Permanent Secretary. And now for our keynote speech, it is our pleasure to welcome Dr. Harold Link, third generation chair, CEO, and owner of B. Grimm. He's also an independent board director of True Corporation Public Company Limited. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Harold Link. Excellency, that means Permanent Secretary, Dr. Chutin Thon Kong Sak. Well, if you feel humbled and nervous, what should I feel? <laughs> Even more. And Dr. Eden Won, uh, Won, thank you so much for inviting me, giving the Grim the opportunity to talk about, about energy, the development of energy. I have prepared some slides, and they've done by our head of strategy, who's with us today, Kondorshaya Supatmanit. And actually, I've been very fortunate to be born into a family that has a company in Thailand since uh, now 142 years, and who shares very similar values or objectives as AIT. I read in the, in the Wikipedia that sustainability and technological development uh, uh, close to the heart of AIT. And what you said just now, social impact with innovation is it as well. And one of our Begrim values is pioneering spirit. So we're not a company that develops a lot of products, but we try to be at the forefront of technology. So what some of you may know or may not know, the Rangsit canals, they were built by the Snit Wong family together with B. Grimm. And so that's why you find all these canals are really straight, because they brought a new technology at that time. Then B. Grimm later participated in all kinds of new technology developments, like, like a, a, one of the first, or maybe the first telegraph concession in Thailand, which even King Rama V wrote about in his visit to, to Berlin. And later, Later, when the government opened the opportunity for private sector to be, take part in the electricity development, we 
we started that especially emphasis on, on attracting industries to invest in Thailand's industrial parks because we all take electricity for granted but big industries they don't so still now where you don't have industrial power plants they kind of hesitate to go because they need high stability and uh, quality of the electricity I really glad that AIT wants to cooperate with private enterprise because I think we really need each other and I'm also fortunate that I became a member of the Thai Chamber of Commerce and they asked me to be a member of the University of Thai Chamber of Commerce Executive Board and I always wanted to see how we can bring internet technology to young Thai entrepreneurs so that our startup industry will be as successful as those in other countries, especially in the United States. So there's a university in Barcelona called Harbor Space and they have a new concept. So every student has to bring a project or develop a project there. They will learn internet technologies and they will learn entrepreneurship. From whom? from experts in the industry all over the world. So they will be taught two or three hours in the morning and then the rest of the day the professors, or in that case the lecturers, they will accompany them in making their project successful. And I really hope that I see Dr. Woon, you go in a similar direction that there will be a good cooperation between the two universities. No. This is what I'm going to talk about and I think we all know the world is changing all the time. Actually, people always say that it was the fastest in the, in the history. I always think that the world has been changing all the time. There were always disruptions. And when you suddenly had the airplane instead of, a, instead of a ship that brought you to Thailand, I mean, that was a huge thing. If you didn't need the post anymore, but you have, suddenly you have the telegraph, and was a big change. But what we are, when we talk about energy, we find actually it's quite exciting now that the, the energy sector, the electricity sector, is changing quite rapidly. Before, it was very straightforward. And now, you see that, that what we call disruptive technologies, they go hand in hand with trying to overcome global warming. And you see that there's much more renewable energy coming. If um, Biden really will be the president of the United States, there will be so much more renewable energy. And what is important is people talk about that solar energy now is as cost effective as coal. But what they don't talk about is the cost of energy storage. Now the sun only shines for a few hours. Wind is very intermittent. If we don't have energy storage, you cannot go past the conventional power, power generation. So we need more energy storage and more energy resources. And on the demand side, there's also a lot of shifting going on. And then before we had, in Thailand, actually we are very fortunate, we have very good public organization. EGAT, PEA, MEA, they are very good organizations. But their task is to supply the whole country. So in our big grim case, we concentrate on renewable energies, yes, but also industrial power. And industrial power needs to be very close to the user and needs to provide something specially for them. So this is going into more decentralized way of doing business. Now, Large organizations, we usually have a lot of trust because they have a lot of good governance. Now it goes more to platforms. But the trouble I find is that platforms are now controlled by very few individuals in the world. So instead of having an individual controlling a bank in Thailand, now you have a person controlling how the way we vote in the whole world, every government in the whole world. So maybe platforms are not the solution as well. Then we have the distributed decision making 
to blockchains where nobody can control anything and that maybe goes more into the future direction. The climate change goals, I think everybody knows, we want to go to net zero by 2050. And if Biden makes it, really, then he will come back and join the Paris Accord, which I think we all hope. And you can see that it's not that easy to go to zero emissions. You can see that actually, even by 2050, to go to zero, people don't see yet how to do that. So the coal emits, even there, some people talk about clean coal. Clean, there's no clean coal. And the strange thing is in Germany, where you have so much solar power, since lignite is cheaper than gas, when the sun doesn't shine enough, they will run the lignite plants instead of the much, much more environmentally friendly natural gas plant. So we have to get out of coal. We still have to use natural gas, and we have to really strongly go into renewable energies. And the crucial part will be the cost of storage. It's very difficult to run grids with intermittent supply, because the grids are not made for that. And there's a development, so you hear about smart grids. So smart grids try to deal with intermittent energy and they try to help us to reduce electricity consumption. And we have to integrate electricity storage. Now electricity storage prices are coming down and fortunately countries in Asia are the leaders. So Korea, China, Japan, they really lead in energy storage development and they invest billions and billions of dollars every year. So we can really hope that this will go well. At the same time, I think we all have to look more at efficient use of energy. All the buildings in Bangkok, they have, the, the glasses are really poor. The windows are poor. So we use so much more electricity in our buildings than we should. And of course we have to replace all our machinery. And you can see there's a trend, but we have to work very hard to make it happen. And you can see these energy trends will be more renewable energies. And renewable energies, we usually think of, of solar, we think of wind. And there are new technologies coming up. I just learned from a friend in Malaysia there's a, finally a technology where you can make oil out of algae in a commercially viable way. So the biggest companies in the world have been trying to do that for 10 years, 15 years, and have not been successful. But there's a Korean company that now made it. So if you can, if you can um, do that, then we can convert the coal-fired power plants using natural algae created um, oil. One, if you look at number six, one thing which should really be the future, and um, many people are looking at it, but the cost is still so high, is green hydrogen. You can make hydrogen with coal and with gas, but then it's not green. The great thing about hydrogen is you can use it for transport. You can also use it for, for power plants and it only emits water. But very few people really put a lot of money in it, and the governments, the money they put in is still a fraction of what is necessary. So the consensus is now is that by 230, that might be a, a, a technology that will be used a lot. But I think this is something governments should push more, because in the moment it's not commercially viable. And of course, digital technologies, they are now used in all power plants to, to great effect, because you want to have predictive maintenance, you want to reduce the number of spare parts, you want to increase the efficiency, and you want to have what they call a digital twin. So you have a real power plant and you create 
a power plant in the net, and so you can forecast and and um, trend the the um, operation of the power plants to use less fuel. So you can see that the the normal system of generation, transmission, distribution, and utilization through large companies is going to change. Now, three, four years ago, nobody was talking really about solar rooftops. Now everybody wants to have solar rooftops. And uh, it has become a really a red ocean industry. Everybody wants to compete in, in um, proposing lower uh, tariffs. And what we have to go get into, you see on the right with the green part there, how can we sell peer-to-peer? -peer? How can people use solar energy on their roofs, and how can they sell to each other? And that is very much government regulated. So the electricity sector is very much government regulated, and we have to work very closely together between the government and the ministry and the private sector and of course, EGAT, PEA, and MEA to make that happen. Now, fortunate thing is now that the Provincial Electricity Authority has a, a subsidiary, so they are allowed to cooperate with the private sector. So we now have our first joint venture with Provincial Electricity Authority, and that way the grids will be used much more efficiently. The Provincial Electricity Authority will learn much more how industries use electricity, what kind of necessity we have. And finally, I think in, in many universities we are told that life is all about competition. You see competitive factors and you have to outcompete somebody else or so. In Big Grim, we think that partnership, cooperation is the way forward. The ones who offer the best services to customers or come up with innovative ideas who have a pioneering way of doing businesses, they will anyway or should be successful. I think we should look at other people as being in the same space. Everybody wants to live. So in our case, we think that it's better to think about cooperation than look at the other company that's in the same sector as an enemy, which applies, of course, to all, all things in life. And you see here that this, for a company like us, it's quite exciting to be now in the power sector because it's really changing. And since we are fortunate that Big Grim has not been originally a utility, but has always been in a highly competitive environment where we always have to think of how do we can do the best for the customer without thinking badly of the other companies who also are in the same business. There are so many changes, and so we, we have to try to look at new fuels, we have to see how can we get the digitization of our businesses organized, how we can really become a digitally transformed company, create new business systems, and how can we all come up with new business models so that we always enjoy 100% availability of electricity with a high degree of reliability. Now, if suddenly the light shuts out for, let's say, two seconds, we think nothing about it because it doesn't affect us. Air conditioning system will run again. But if you have a, if you are a Sumitomo rubber who produces huge tires, you cannot even have a split second of a voltage drop. Otherwise, your whole factory stands still. So this is where we have to get to. So we have to provide power like that. Or when you have a data center, the data center, you really don't want to have the power to, to fail or to drop. So now when you have a lot of intermittent electricity supply going into the net. The electricity grid cannot handle it. So we have to develop these smart grids. You see every country 
faces these problems and every every electricity supplier faces that. The other thing you face is that when you are state enterprise, EGAT PE and MEA, you have to supply your transmission network, whether people use it 24 hours a day or maybe only two hours a day. And in the moment, nobody is paying for that. So the moment, actually if you look at it from a social point of view, the ones who have enough money to put a solar roof on their house, they, they get electricity as a discount because we don't charge companies for providing the backup electricity when the sun doesn't shine. But the poor people also have a house, but they don't have solar roof. They somehow now have to subsidize the wealthier ones. But if you want to charge for the standby, then you will have a public outcry. So actually, the, the Ministry of Energy, they, they face a dilemma. But I think it's good for us all to understand that actually we, we don't want poor people to subsidize those who are wealthy. It should be rather the other way around. Here you see, you see the way the grids are done. And so we have to develop smart grids that can take any intermittent power at any time. Solar is actually quite mild because the sun shines quite regularly and you usually the cloud formation is also regular. But wind is completely different. Wind is completely, wind really spikes like this and it goes like that and spikes like that and suddenly there's none. So that creates a big issue. In Denmark, they, they have so much wind energy that they actually at times can supply the whole country, so they manage that already. At the same time, we also want to pay less for electricity and not more. And we want to have more energy storage so that we can take this intermittent power from, from solar and, and wind, store them, and stabilize the grid. And of course, we all hope that we can go to 100% renewable energy quite soon. And people are really innovative. So who would have thought that there's a Korean who will come up different from the SOBP Chevron of the world and produce competitive priced oil from algae? So this year, they will, we will have the first plant going up in, in Malaysia, and we hope that we can use that soon. And they're sure that they can convert coal-fired power plant to that. And the algae emission, of course, is net zero, because algae, to grow, they use CO2. And then when they're burned, they remit CO2. But we made much less than gas or, or oil. And so that's one way to the future. Once we have um, more wind, more solar at very competitive prices, we can produce green hydrogen. Green hydrogen we can put in all the cars and we can emit just water. And an another very good system of producing electricity is now used by the Electricity Generation Authority of Thailand. They have the first project, which Bigrim is fortunate to be able to install, is 45 megawatt on a dam, on Sirinton Dam. So what you do is you produce electricity, so as long as the sun is shining with sun, and then afterwards you can release the water. And so these dams are great, of course, so storage is, a, is our, our biggest energy storage systems are the dams. And even though, of course, there will probably not more dams coming up, they will be used for full and about nearly 10% of all capacity we have today, we need to use today, can be installed on, on, on the water. So EGAT has the potential to, to have 2,500 megawatt solar on, on water, and we hope they will implement it soon. Now, talking a little bit about 
um, be grim. We have had the objective to, to provide very reliable and stable electricity to industries at the lowest possible cost. And so the best opportunity possibility was to use natural gas. Natural gas still emits carbon dioxide and NOx, but much less than other conventional powers. And so we think that, and we see in talks with the manufacturer of the turbines, that they can actually use hydrogen more and more. So that is a, a, that's a transfer that's going to happen, especially if you talk about 2050, which is still 30 years ahead. So by that time, I presume all gas turbines in the world will be able to, to use uh, green hydrogen that is produced by renewable energy. And I think all over the world, people will use more solar energy on, on, their, on their dams. And now also all the industrial parks, wherever they have a water storage system, which they all need, there will be solar energy on them. So we started in 2015, which is only five years ago, in Thailand. And then we have a, some small, very beautiful projects in Laos. So they are run of the river power plants. So we don't have to cut trees and, and uh, build huge dams to produce electricity. But we have the river, we run it through a chute. And so you, you, if you go there, the, the environment is so beautiful. You have beautiful waterfalls. And we, we grow more trees there in this area. And so we have some in, in Laos. And then the opportunity came to go to Vietnam and build really big power plants. So we built a 420 megawatt next to a huge lake that supplies water to Ho Chi Minh City. So they are on nearly 200,000 big concrete columns. And the area is about 500 hectares, about 3,000 rai used for that. Then we have another one, so that's 420 megawatt. Then we have another one, 257 megawatt. And that is using land that they couldn't use anymore to grow, <coughs> to grow vegetables because the land was bad quality. So we did that and now support the, the surrounding villages with technology and how can they improve their farming on, on soil that is really good. And then we, we started to build a waste to energy plant, which is not running yet, and plan many more uh, other projects. We have wind farms in Korea. We're uh, planning wind farms in Vietnam. We are building a wind farm in Thailand. And so all these renewable energy projects are really important. And we now use energy storage systems. We build the, actually the it's a very innovative concept for the Utah Power Airport. So we will supply solar energy to the airport and the community there. And we have uh, one of the biggest energy storage systems anywhere is 50 megawatt hours. And combined cycle cogeneration, which has the highest efficiency. So you can provide chilled water, you can provide steam, provide electricity to the Utah Power Airport. And that's one of the one of the major infrastructure projects the government has planned for the Eastern Economic Corridor. And so, finally, how do we do our, our digital transformation? You can see there are many, many parts in, in every power plant that, that will be affected by digital transformation. What in the moment, what, what is a really good use is make sure that the efficiency is the highest. And then we can do predictive maintenance and preventive maintenance so we don't have to shut down the plants. And we can use the parts as long as, as possible, which in the moment, if you, have a, if you have your own car, after 15 or 20,000 kilometers, the sign will come up and says, you have to go to service. That is just counting your kilometers. 
nobody has any clue of whether you need any part change or so, but it's just by the engineering design, they think after 20,000 hours, kilometers, you should go and see the garage. But for the power plant, you actually do not want to have to open your turbines if everything is still wonderfully fine in there because it takes many days to take it out and to reduce your income sharply. So if we can have use digital data with a lot of IoT, Internet of Things, a lot of measurements, we can come to the point that we only have to have to repair or upgrade when the machines tell us they are ready now. So it's like when you, when you know that you're sick, you go to a doctor. So in the future, the machines will know when they're not yet sick, but there's a danger that they will become sick. So we can, we can do that. And um, we think that we use all the technologies that are available and look at all technologies available all over the country and uh, of course in America and Europe in Israel and also make sure that the cyber security is is fantastic because you don't want cyber security attack on the electricity system in your country you don't want somebody to blow up our gas pipelines and you don't want anybody to to do something to our electricity system because then we are all in the dark and our computers don't run. Finally, my favorite subject doesn't have to do with the future of energy but has something to do with COVID. Most of these pandemics, they come from the trade of wild animals. And Actually, I've written to the Prime Minister and said, please, can we stop the trade of wild animals so that we don't have COVID-21? And he kindly sent that to the Minister of Natural Resources and Environment, who told me that definitely Thailand will stop the trade of wild animals. And I think if we don't want to have the next COVID, I think it would be great if everybody cooperates and tells all people they know, please stop the trade of wild animals. Let them be there where they are. We are where we are, and we all can live happily ever after. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Ling, for an insightful presentation. Please remain on the stage as I invite our AT president to present a token of appreciation. Thank you, Dr. Ling, but Mr. President, kindly remain on the stage as I invite Deputy Permanent Secretary onto the stage for a token of appreciation from AIT. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you, Mr. President. And now, before we begin our first panel of the event, I'd like to invite you to watch a video message from Mr. Ashraf Habibullah. He is president and CEO of Computers and Structures, Inc., or CSI USA. CSI has been actively collaborating with AIT for nearly 20 years on many initiatives, including student scholarships, research and development, joint seminars, software development, and many other programs. CSI is also one of the sponsors of this event. Let's have a listen. A welcome and greetings from California. I'm Ashraf Habibullah, and it's an incredible pleasure for me to be with you today, even though I'm not there in person. You know, those that know me know how much I love the Asian Institute of Technology. Every time I go there, the love, the friendship, and the deference that everybody showers upon me 
doesn't go unnoticed. It's always such an incredible experience to visit the university. And I look forward to going there again and again and again. And every event I come to at AIT, it's a celebration. And I get to dress up and have the most incredible time with everybody. And even though I'm not there in person, I don't think there's any reason why I should not dress up and celebrate with all of you. So here we go. How's that? Well, on a serious note, I know it's hard to be serious when you're wearing a jacket like this. What I believe is that human beings are created for one fundamental reason. And that reason is to make the life of another human being better. And the beauty about AIT is that it makes life better for all of humanity on a daily basis with the technology and the innovation that it has produced at least over the past 20 years that I've witnessed it. That also makes AIT the perfect backdrop for an event like this that is defining the path as we move towards 2030. You know, I also believe that education is a fundamental human right. And also, along those lines, the thing that I really appreciate about AIT, it's an international educational institution that provides education for students from all across the world, you think, and providing the gift of education for all of humanity. That's what this world needs. I just hope that this pandemic ends soon and I will be back there in Bangkok to see in person, to meet every one of you in person. And I promise you, the biggest party and celebration that Bangkok has ever seen. Meanwhile, stay healthy, Stay safe and enjoy this event. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ashraf Habibullah. Always a pleasure and always in style. Just to give you some examples of his collaboration with AIT, he was at our 100X event last year and also hosted the 100X after party for us, which was one of the most memorable events of the year. He was also with us for the seventh Asia Conference on Earthquake Engineering, Structural Engineering Backbone of Built Environment 2018 and dinner talk by Ashraf Habibullah 2018, just to name a few. So another round of applause for Mr. Ashraf Habibullah, please.